Good afternoon. I'm Piazzandro Cocconcelli. I'm Director's Delegate for Internationalization of Universidad Católica, and I would like to welcome all the participants uh, to the online event, Internationalization Today, Experience at Home and From Abroad. This event is part of the International Week of the Università Católica. It is an opportunity for students uh, in more than 40 events uh, to meet and discuss the internet with the international office staff uh, and to attend meetings with the partners, uh, universities and uh, companies which are collaborating for the process of internationalization in our university. Moreover, students currently joining international program have shared their experience uh, and about the internationalization uh, in our university. This year, the motto is uh, New World and New Ways, and you will see why we have chosen uh, this particular sentence later on. Universidad Católica has expanded over the last decades uh, its international attitude. Actually, the area of global engagement and internationalization is one of the major components of the university activity. In the last years, we have implemented strategies for the comprehensive internationalization. This is the process of permeating the international perspective in all the university missions, the teaching that is mainly affecting students, research, students and academics, and the service to society. Today, I would like to briefly introduce some of the key topics of the internationalization, and in particular, those related to opportunities for students. In, uh, in the last years, the internationalization of higher education has seen an increased number of uh, English taught programs uh, and uh, an increased uh, proportion of uh, visiting professors teaching in our university. We have also had an expansion of the inter internationalization at home. Uh, Professor Murphy will enter in details of this strategy, which is the integration into the university curriculum of international and intercultural dimension for all the students, even those that are studying in our domestic environment. And then student mobility, which is one of the key topic uh, for the meeting of today. In the last years, we have seen a public progressive increase of the student mobility, reaching almost 3,000 students per year, more or less the 10% of our student population, if we consider the uh, master of Science and the Bachelor. And we, in the last four years, there was uh, a 30% increase uh, of uh, student mobility, a clear indication that this process is seen as uh, a very important component uh, of the university curriculum for students. Mobility has been supported by university, by the Erasmus uh, program, Erasmus Plus program, and by uh, the uh, Italian Ministry for University with more than 100, uh, 1,300 fellowships. So we have tried to support as much as possible our students. However, pandemic has drastically affected this process. Uh, when pandemic uh, was uh, communicated, there were more than 700 students abroad. And uh, we are still suffering of the limitation linked to the, to the pandemic and uh, the absence of traveling and so on. So this has really reduced the possibilities for physical mo mobility. However, we have seen uh, and we have learned as professors and as students that there is another way to make uh, the university teaching. And this is one of the topics of today and it's also our motto new world, new ways. It means that we can learn, well, we have learned and we can plan for the next future different ways to, uh, to follow university courses and also to enter in an international dimension. This afternoon, we will discuss these topics uh, with a very interesting panel. And in particular, uh, we have uh, Amanda Murphy. Amanda is the director of the Center for Higher Education internationalization of our university, a resource center that is totally focused on the internationalization strategies. Uh, Patrick Colabucci is the former director of international programs 
and Director of Business Deve Development at Global Online UCLA Expansion. Thanks to Patrick, we have developed a number of international programs in collaboration with UCLA. Nanette Rick Mister, uh, she's the Director of Expertise in Labo Mobility and Client Service in Europe and North America for iGraduate. She's a real expert of the internationalization and labor mobility, as well as the iGraduate, which is a comparative assessment of the, world, of the education sector worldwide, uh, fixing the, uh, benchmarks for the quality of universe. We are collaborating with Annette uh, during the last 10 years. And then it's your Fanyan. He's the director of the HR training of Comao, a leading company in the industrial automation. ESO will provide the view of the high technology environment and the relevance for internationalization in education and uh, uh, post-education steps. So thank you very much to all these experts. I will start immediately with Amanda. Amanda, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Pier Sandro. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted that the uh, the, the Center uh, for Higher Education Internationalization, which I'm has been invited to take part in this very important initiative. Um, I'd just like to concentrate for one minute on the word internationalization, because we all think we know what it means. And we also probably think that the university is already an international place. And in fact, the first universities uh, that ever existed in the 1200s were, of course, international. There were many international students who moved from Paris to Bologna to Padova uh, to Oxford as well. So it's true that the university experience is supposed to be an international one right from its very origins. But nowadays, we associate internationalization um, mostly with mobility. But as Pier Sandro uh, hinted at before, in fact, it's really between 10 and 20% of students who can actually have an experience abroad. Now that might be quite a lot, but there's also about 80% of people who cannot actually travel. So first of all, what does it really mean to have a, to have a university experience which is internationalized? Well, the definitions of internationalization talk about an international or an intercultural dimension, okay, to all the aspects of university life. So this is, for example, the teaching experience, the learning experience, the research experience, and also the third mission, the service to society. And should we say the most um, recent definitions of internationalization of higher education talk about these same dimensions, but saying that it must be like an intention on the part of the university to create an experience which is internationalized, a global experience in, in both the, um, shall we say, the functions of the university and the way in which it, uh, it is delivered. And the reason behind this is for better quality. All right, we're interested in a good quality experience, an educational experience, which enables um, students to understand and function well in the globalized society that we that we live in today. Now, um, although there is a, a, an important emphasis on mobility, for example, I myself started my, my life in Italy because I came as an inter international student um, and, I, and I got to love the country and the people and that was one of the reasons for actually wanting to, to move. So we can't really divorce an international experience from the idea of traveling from country to country. But it is important to realize that there's so much more than actual uh, traveling, okay? So we talk nowadays um, about trying to create an, exclu an inclusive experience of internationalization by creating internationalization at home and internationalization of the curriculum. And you might ask yourselves what exactly that means. And in my research center, we have a number of PhD students, for example, who are trying to understand what does it mean to internationalize the curriculum? Well, it means, for example, incorporating different uh, points of view from different cultures, different um, um, readings that students have to do, 
It means looking even at the composition of the classroom and saying, we actually have an international experience within these four walls. I mean, diversity in the classroom is something which is automatically there as soon as you get a group of people together because you've got diversity that's also national, not only international. So internationalization at home doesn't have to um, mean traveling abroad. Internationalization at home can be done through changing the curriculum. It can be done through changing the way um, a course is assessed as well. I mean, when we have international students coming to our university, they have a very different experience from one they get at home. And if we want to internationalize the way we teach and we learn, we need to incorporate experiences from abroad. All right. So it's a question of changing the syllabus. It's a question of changing what happens in the testing. And it's a way of changing the teaching as well. Now, as um, Pier Sandro said, um, one of the ways in which our university and universities all around the world are internationalizing without a, a mobility is teaching through English. Now, teaching through English does not, um, does not mean the same thing as having an international experience. Okay, I mean, as I said before, you need to think about the different viewpoints on a syllabus. You need to think of different ways of presenting the same um, content. But teaching through English does mean that there is um, automatically a bigger audience because it means people can come from different universities into our university and uh, can, can meet an international audience within the same classroom. So English medium education or English medium instruction is, shall we say, one of the strategies that the universities adopt in order to create an international environment, okay? Um, now, uh, from the university's point of view, we need to help our staff um, actually be able to teach uh, through English. So one of the efforts of the center that I direct is to help the teachers have an international experience, even though they are teaching in their home university. So we have organized a series of teaching modules. We've organized um, a series of, of seminars online at the moment, which um, is, is of course the, the, the upside of this pandemic that, uh, that we've got. We can bring international people into the classroom. So we're, we're creating training modules for um, uh, teachers from the university, um, whereby they can internationalize the way that they actually teach. Now that's the teachers, but we've also got the student point of view. Now, one of the ways in which we can create an international experience for students, internationalization at home, is by using virtual exchange. And one of the things that um, we promote in the center and that we, um, shall we say, uh, train the teachers to manage is to um, participate in international projects um, by teaming up universities, okay? So we have um, a number of projects whereby the students from our university are able to interact with students from American universities, from Israeli universities, from Polish universities, and um, actually have credit for the, um, the activities which take place purely online. So that is what is meant by virtual exchange. And virtual exchange is an extremely effective way, a new way of creating an international atmosphere within the classroom. Now, apart from the teaching and the learning, the last, um, shall we say, uh, environment within the university, uh, which is, is what we could call the informal curriculum. That means student associations. Now, student associations or buddy programs are also a way of creating an international experience for students who cannot travel for whatever reason, whether it's because of something like the pandemic or whether it's for family reasons or whatever. And this kind of experience makes internationalization an inclusive experience, not something which is only for the 20% of the people who are able to travel. Okay, so that Pier Sandro is, is in a nutshell, the sort of areas that we as a center are, are working on. So teaching, learning, and of course the third mission, the, uh, the working with society. So things like volunteering associations as well. Um, those are the aspects of internationalization which we try and shall we say, bring to the larger public, not just to the 20% who are able to, um, to, to travel. I think I, I would stop here and see if there's anything that, uh, anybody would like to ask, or else I just I just pass the floor back to you. Thank you very much, Amanda. You provide a very clear view of what we are trying to do and what we are doing in these uh, 
PA of the, in our university, just to give an information to students and to families. Uh, we have just launched uh, what is called a global conversation. Actually, it's a process that was raised up by a group of students in Boston College in the US, and we are recruiting students, but actually we are just pro proposing to students because it's totally managed by students, and they start to exchange and to discuss on uh, big uh, challenges that we have in front of us, such as climate or migration. So I think it's a good opportunity here for the process of internationalization. Uh, now, I, I think that, Annette, uh, uh, your, your view is fundamental. Uh, it's fundamental for us and for our, for our students. Your vision is a global vision. You work in Europe, you work in the uh, US. So how you can foresee the future of uh, internationalization uh, for students and when they will enter in the labor market? Thanks for unmuting me. That helps to, to speak and answer your question. Um, how I think that will change, um, I think virtual, the, what Amanda spoke about, the virtual internships are a very important one. And not just virtual internships, but also virtual working. We're all um, stuck in our, our home countries, our home offices, or even just our home kitchen tables. And that means that um, in that sense, we... Um, it doesn't mean that we're not a need to connect. The need to connect stays there and the need to understand how people from different cultures do things differently. But on the other hand, um, the, the, that whole underlying sphere of being able to internationalize is a very important one. And I think we should help our students to understand that and help them to be ready for a job market that looks for that kind of a thing. Because I don't think that the, the job market will change that much. I think we will still see a very international job market. I hope that's an answer to your question. Sorry, I can't hear you. So yeah, I was muted. Uh, thank you very much. Your your response was perfect. Uh, I think that you have prepared a presentation to show. Is it correct? That's correct. So it's... So what I wanted to talk to you about is, um, well, as was being said by the previous speakers, new world and new ways. And um, um, with this new world and new ways, it was mentioned that I work both with I graduate and with uh, expertise in labor mobility. And I'll show you something from both of them. I'll start with something from I graduate. On the next slide, you will see some data coming from the International Student Barometer. And this is an online benchmark survey. Uh, the data that you see here is for 179, 500 students. So almost 180,000 students across the globe from uh, institutions in 19 different countries and we've asked them how do you decide where you want to study and an interesting thing and linking back to the, the previous question is future career impact that is really the top one above university reputation above country reputation and above specific country uh, uh, program uh, reputation where people decide to come to a particular institution now that whole importance of future career is an important one to realize because also in the top five for happiness, employability is the top one. And also for recommendation, employability is also uh, the first one. So it's a really important one to realize. But you see that, well, that, that red cross through um, the, the global world where we're all traveling, the fact that we're not traveling or less traveling because there's there's still some travel possible doesn't mean there's nothing happening and i want to show you some technological or some changes that we see in the uh, job market uh, happening throughout the world on the next slide and we all have seen technological change the robots are coming Globalization, I already mentioned the fact that we are not traveling as much as we used to do doesn't mean it's not a global job market. And I'm sure one of the other speakers will touch upon that one as well. You talk one 
in one morning to somebody from Brazil and somebody from China, and maybe even somebody from Russia in the same morning. So it's still a very global world out there. There's another big change on the labor market, and that's you, the students, Gen Z, big demographic changes happening there. That whole generational change also has um, brought another change, which I think is a very important one, environmental sustainability. So the fact that we are not traveling is in that sense a really good one. We also see a lot of urbanization, and that brings also increasing inequality, political uncertainty. We've all seen, well, the US elections unfold. And then on top of that, we had COVID-19. So quite a lot of labor market trends. And on the next slide, you see that it was definitely a big crash. Um, we asked as I graduate students during the first few weeks of the pandemic, what their main concerns were. And um, some of the, it were 21,000 students answering and they mentioned psychological problems, mental health risk, but the second one that was being mentioned throughout the globe was really the worry uh, around future career impact. So that future world of work is a really important one. And I've taken two quotes about that future world of work that I think are important ones to realize. One is about uh, coming from somebody in Australia, uh, Dina Wilcox, who said, just learning a thing and believing that that thing will be the trick that will help you further, um, that is not going to work. And she really doubts if it's ever was working. So your ability to change, that is the most important one. During another webinar, I mentioned myself that the only constant that we have is change. It's not just the pandemic, but the world has been changing constantly. If I talk to employers, all they say is there's constant change and we need people that have almost in their DNA the ability to deal with constant change. And if we look at the next slide, I've tried to give you a little bit of an overview of what are the skills that are people looking for post pandemic or already during this pandemic. I mentioned that I work for expertise in labor mobility and we talk a lot with employers. And in our work with employers, I had a virtual coffee break with a, a group of employers. And one of them said, well, globally mobile does no longer mean being able to relocate or being able to travel extensively. It is really about being able to do a global job. So cultural awareness, as Amanda already mentioned, you can learn and use cultural awareness in a virtual setting very, very well. But cultural awareness is a key one. In that virtual setting, you need digital skills. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty difficult. And you definitely need adaptability. If there's one thing that this, this pandemic showed us, adaptability is a key one. And the top skill that is being mentioned by employers nowadays is empathy. Really the ability to care and feel for other people. So that empathy is something that is a real important one. And on the next slide, I'll showcase um, an, an app that we've developed and that we work with with Catholica, and that's called Career Professor That Works. And what the app does, it shows you intercultural scenarios and all of the students are really uh, invited to use the app because it will really help you to understand how to do business, how to look for work, and how to socially interact with people across the globe, whether it's France, whether it's Germany, whether it's Brazil, whether it's the US, understanding those cultural differences and how people see certain things and why they would do certain things are really, really key. And I want to end with this last slide showing you a text and you don't need to read the entire text but the most important thing is it's Davina Potts who did a research in Australia saying every job is international and people need international competencies and the ability to adapt and interact with people from across the globe because that's really what we need as society but also what we need as people individually. That's it. I think you're still on mute. Hi, 
yes, thank you very much, uh, Annette. Uh, I think now we can see the view from Patrick. Uh, uh, Patrick comes from uh, UCLA, and we have an ongoing experience uh, with this uh, university. I'm sure you can much better than me explain what is on ongoing. Thank you very much, uh, and thanks for Ka to uh, Katalika for putting this on. Um, I lived abroad for about 20 years, mostly in Japan and China, and then in the Middle East. So this internationalization is very personal to me. And I'd like to provide some historical context about technology in higher education um, and some thoughts on how the power of this technology uh, fits with the transformational power of the study abroad experience. And if time, I'll talk a little bit about how internationalization at universities in the post-pandemic world might work. For historical context, um, the World Wide Web was founded in 1989, and quickly people knew this would change the world. And universities, which pretty much looked the same in 1989 as they did in 1889, would soon be, soon be changing more quickly than they had ever changed before. From research to teaching, from learning to internationalization, it would all be changing. And the speed of this change was going to be faster than ever and unstoppable. And in 1993, just four years after the web was founded, a professor, Allison King, was writing about the future of teaching and learning with technology. And she wrote that professors would be the sage on stage, not the guide, on, uh, would, would not be the sage on stage. They would be the guide on the side. So Sage is this wise person on the stage telling students what they need to know. But this concept was going to be a fundamental change to teaching and learning at universities. For centuries, in most college classrooms, the professor would lecture, the students would listen and take notes. The professor was the central figure, the sage on the stage, sharing knowledge. And the students would merely receive the knowledge, memorize it, maybe for an exam. They might not even think about it. This was merely a transmission model. And it assumes that the student's brain was an empty container and the professor would just pour in knowledge. This is not effective in the 21st century. Individuals have access to immense amount of information and global communities from friends to music fans to social media tools. These are freely and widely available and they're changing the knowledge people have. In this new interconnected world, students will be expected to solve complex problems, problems that may be different in every country or every city, but similar problems. Students will be expected to produce knowledge rather than merely reproduce knowledge. And everyone, every student, every professor will bring a different knowledge base to the classroom experience. And this knowledge base has to be shared and explored. Now let's look at the context of knowledge and learning. Until 1900, it's estimated that human knowledge doubled approximately once a century. It took 100 years to double the knowledge of the world. By 1950, it was doubling every 25 years. In the year 2000, human knowledge was doubling about every year. And now it's estimated that knowledge, because of the web, because of the internet, because of social media, can double in a week. So, a famous professor from the States, uh, a, a thinker and an architect named Buckminster Fuller, he called this the knowledge doubling curve. It shows how fast the amount of knowledge changes and how young people need to be able to keep aware of all of this. Every individual contributes to the creation of knowledge and the understanding of that knowledge. With the speed of knowledge creation, the tools available to learners. One, one second, uh, apologies. Uh, with the tools available to learners and the need to apply knowledge to solve complex global problems, the sage on stage model is just ineffective. 
the guide on the side whereby students own their learning and the professor is helping them is relevant. It reflects a more collaborative, global connected world, and that's the world we live in. Now, let's talk about how the power of technology fits in with the transformational power of the study abroad experience. One of these areas is language use and acquisition. We know foreign language ability improves through the study abroad experience. We also have indications now that this improvement happens as well in an online environment, just differently. We know that students are learning languages and using languages, not their first language, online to communicate with people, to work on school projects. And this is improving the language fluency and acquisition of, people, of students. We know that through the online experience overall, students have more foreign language input. And as a language learner, input is a key factor. But online, the learner, the student, has more time and more resources to process and understand it. The student's academic experience in the online environment is a rich one. Universities come in many shapes and forms and cultures. Some are dogmatic. Some are research-focused. Some are open access. Some are urban. Some are rural. All of these differences in the online environment, these distinctions are lessened, and the universities will be focusing on serving the students and student learning. Universities are making resources like tutoring offices, writing centers, conversation groups, academic advising, all available virtually. Students can connect with current students online before even arriving in a new country. They can do it virtually. So international students can avail of these university services without leaving their home. The online environment as well simulates the reality of the future workplace. This is not the case in the traditional classroom experience. In online learning environments, students interact, they engage with each other. They immediately research problems or ideas. They ask questions of each other, they offer ideas, and they collaborate to solve problems together. This reflects the reality of the work environment of the future. And I know many students have a friend or a sibling or a cousin who studied abroad. And I think comparing the experiences is not helpful. And a quote from Theodore Roosevelt, a former president of the United States, wrote, comparison is the thief of joy. So I hope the younger generation is looking at new ways to learn as they drive the learning. Uh, and I'll I'll stop there and, and and we'll move on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, you provide a very clear view uh, and picture of the evolution of the university context. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, now it's time to see what is the request from companies. And Ezio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And uh, this is a really nice uh, initiative in order to uh, share what is happening to the world in our professional and personal world. I'm going to say something about Kumau, who we are. We are just a company. Then I'm going to say something about what is changing our uh, uh, new way of working due also to the COVID uh, uh, situation and also the so what that we perceived on the, on, for the educational world in which we are working. And so, something about Comau. Comau is an industrial automation and a robotics leader worldwide. We are expert, in, and in the next slide, you will see uh, some picture of what we are uh, producing that are robots, uh, AI system, uh, uh, and all the technological toys that will help factories to produce goods. Uh, where we are in the world, in the next slide, we are uh, already global. We are uh, in all the countries, main countries, uh, and we are working for all the global companies that are uh, uh, that has produ producing challenges uh, from uh, FCA 
to Ford from General Motors to Tesla. Elon Musk is one of our customers. And I'm so lucky because also I had the chance to present what we are doing to um, Jeff Bezos that came in Turin visiting our company. And so we are lucky. We are Italian excellence in the, in the, at the center of, uh, of the innovation, technology and human innovation. And uh, uh, what is happening in our world? The, in, the business is changing. The context is changing. From one side, you know better than me that we are in the VUCA world complexity, volatility, ambiguity. There are disrupted technology, AI, Internet of Things, uh, um, additive manufacturing and robotics and so on. And it is the first time that we have five different generation at work. And trust on me, they are really different from the old uh, um, builders to the millennials and to the young students. And so it's it's, a right, it's, it's quite challenging, but uh, there is an exponential complexity, next slide, that is linked to the COVID situation. And so in the first time, uh, you know, we were all busy on respond to the change. The first weeks, uh, it was in February uh, 2020, March, and then uh, recovery, April, May, the first wave, and then it was time to renew. And we are living a magic uh, innovation, innovative way that we were not expecting, that we were not looking for. But uh, now that it's happening, we are trying to get the best from this situation. And so in the next slide, you will see that uh, there is a sort of, uh, there are two dimensions. One is the physical dimension in the iceberg that is the visible side. And so for sure, we are changing workplace. We are at home. We have a different workplaces, workspaces, but in this iceberg, there is also uh, under the water, a different digital user experience that is linked to the communication. It is linked with the productivity, with the working process, uh, and for sure, there is also the cyber security, but something is happening in our professional and personal worlds. And uh, we did a survey in the next slide. We asked to about 4,000 colleagues that are working in Italy, US, in China, in Brazil, Romania, in India, in all over the world, uh, to ask them what is happening, how is changing your way of working, and please, Pay attention to the result of this survey because uh, uh, they are really useful in order to create a specular way of learning that is uh, more linked uh, on, on, on what is happening in the company. And so the result of this survey that you will see in the next slide is uh, it's, uh, shocking, it's amazing. And so uh, let me say 62% they think that uh, uh, working by remotely has given an improvement in my organization and completion of the work. And so the level of effectiveness is increased. And it seems so strange because we are alone in our house without having colleagues, coffee break machine. We are suffering this situation. It's not a social, so nice situation, but the, the productivity is increasing. And we ask them why. And so rank in order of importance the following feature for an effective smart working model. The first place is trust-based culture. That is sure, it's important because I, I stay at home, I can play tennis, I can watch the TV all day, and my boss has to trust me that I'm really working. So, but it's, it was the same also in the office, my friend. The trust-based culture is useful not just when I at home, but if I'm a salesman, when I'm visiting customer, when I'm in the office, when I'm working. So this is for both reality, not just for the virtual reality. Look to the second place. Management by objectives and results. For sure, it's useful for virtual work, but it's also useful for in-office work. 
and the companies that are not objective and result based are going are going are going to die third place flexibility for place high level of autonomy uh, fifth openness in continuous change these ingredients are the same ingredients for a perfect receipt not just for the virtual world but also for the normal way of work and so this bad situation due to the coronavirus that we we we, did, we don't love but there is is helping us to re, 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 rediscover to uh, uh, rethink the way of working discovering the trust objectives autonomies openness are main ingredients for a perfect working receipt and so we are here to talk about education even if i'm uh, with the head of a company that is a, a worldwide company that is surfing the technology innovation so what for us the first message in the next slide is uh, yes connected to the fact that uh, okay adaptability communication there is something positive in every change and we must teach and you have to teach to your students uh, that there is uh, always a glass half full and this is uh, a good way in order to have a look to the to the work but the second lesson learned that there is in the next slide is the copy and paste of what Annette said I fully agree with her and there are new capabilities that are coming and this is a, a research that Comau is doing together with uh, Catholic University and next year we're going to publish a book explain that the soft skill are becoming art skills that for sure theories models are fundamental the hard the job description to do different jobs are important but uh, are not uh, the main <laughs> focus in order to be effective in the world of work it's a matter of like Ber Bersing said of power skills and so let me read pro quickly these skills uh, let me start no go back please uh, uh, on the previous slide please let's let me read it the the in the uh, bottom uh, left uh, deal with human we must learn <laughs> That, uh, that deal with human is key, not just for sales people, for designer, for engineers, uh, for finance, for marketing, like deal with technology. That doesn't mean to be a technician, means to leverage on the innovation coming from technology. Agility. <laughs> we are learning every day from the previous mistakes that we did, changing the path in order to arrive sharp at the center of the um, customer needs. Talking about engagement, putting the, let me say the, 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 the our cleaver, our, let me say our mind, but also our heart. And then collaboration, that means to create an open, an ecosystem of people able to exchange knowledge and interdisciplinary, that means to create an ecosystem of disciplines that are not the silos of our function that we have in the company, that are not the silos of the disciplines the time that there are in the university. I want to be provocative. But is the internet connection between art and technology, between anthropology and marketing, uh, between among all the disciplines that doesn't be like a silos but they must be interconnected and for sure a big big uh, push on 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 innovation and so the first so what for us that came from this change that are coming from the world of work is in line with a net speech we need new capabilities and both university and uh, and a company must be focused on on them uh, providing this capability like we are using in the company in a smart work environment and so giving task giving objective 
leaving the time to perform them and then checking the results like you used to do with exercise, project work, field project, and so on. The second lesson learned is linked, and that you will see in the next slide, on what uh, said before the previous speaker, that uh, we must move from a teach, teacher perspective to the learner perspective. And so offering not just content-driven learning opportunities, but many, many action-driven learning opportunities that are not just the learning by doing that we know well, but also what we call uh, learning by unique experience, really positive or really negative. But they, they are, we have learned a lot from, different, from past difficulties and errors. And, and so we have to offer to the students the opportunity to lose, to make something great or to make something bad and to learn from this experience. Or what we call action-driven learning from contingency situation where, where we don't know how to do and what to do. We have to look for knowledge and then to apply it. But for sure, in order to develop these skills in this challenging situation, it's also important to promote what we call relationship-driven learning. That means to give the opportunity for social interaction, like we are doing in this uh, seminar, but also from learning by, let me say, example to offer, especially to young generation models coming from the work of world that can be, that can inspire them to be a wonderful and a great finance, to be a great um, HR, in order to be a great marketing guy, in order to be an happy person able to achieve results. This is a short speech, but I want to summarize saying that the world is changing and we are there as a company to leverage on the opportunities that are coming from this change. And we are asking to university like you are to follow us in this uh, challenging uh, path. Thank you for listening. This is uh, my short speech. Thank you very much, Ezio. Uh, I think that uh, it has been a very interesting presentation. Well, uh, I wish to express my gratitude uh, for all the speakers of this uh, webinar. Uh, we have seen from different perspectives uh, uh, that the education world is changing. And this uh, change should be uh, taken in consideration by all the different uh, components of the university. And as professor, we have to modify our way of teaching. We have to learn how to teach. Uh, the capabilities that are needed are totally different. We are in a new world and we need new ways. I hope that this short webinar has provided to all the students uh, some indication. Please feel free to contact us and take in consideration that to, tomorrow is the last day of the International Week, but uh, on the socials and on different communication media, we can keep in contact between uh, the university and all the student community. Thank you very much for your attendance.